Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Brandon and Ben. Next panel, we want to uh, bring up Kelly Goes from the law firm of Jackson Kelly. Uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, she's going to serve as the moderator for this panel. Also going to have Keith Burdett, who's our current uh, cabinet secretary for the West Virginia Department of Commerce, and Tom Haywood from the law firm of, of Bowles Rice. We'll have Kelly serve as the moderator on this next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I thought because I sort of, a tra I, we're talking about the transition in the economy of West Virginia. And so since I immediately uh, preceded Keith and had the luxury of a little bit of a surplus, which he would probably love, um, before the economy started to decline, I'm going to give a little bit of a history of where we were. And then uh, these gentlemen are going to take over where we are and how we can get there. Uh, when I was Secretary of Commerce, uh, a person that I know very well handed me a folder and said, I was cleaning out a corporate office and I found this promotional materials for West Virginia and I thought you would be interested. And there was a great map of West Virginia and that we're 500 miles away from two-thirds of the population. It talked about our workforce and our work ethic and our abundance of natural resources and the infrastructure that we have in the state, roads, rail, and uh, rivers, and it talked about recruiting companies to come to West Virginia, taking advantage of our proximity and all of these benefits. Um, and the really interesting thing about that brochure was that it was written under Governor Marland in the 1950s. <laughs> so West Virginia from the state level has been diversifying and working to diversify the economy for a very long time. And out of Governor Marland's vision, uh, around that time period, we had the chemical industry. And at one time, Canal Valley had more patents flowing out of the valley than anywhere else. And then, following the chemical industry, which there's a natural ebb and flow to all these industries, we kind of take it personally in West Virginia, but it happens everywhere. Uh, under the vision of Senator Rockefeller, we developed an automotive industry. We developed an international automotive industry. Uh, and we have these companies that have come here, and we've innovated in that industry to the point where there's procedures and processes that were invented by West Virginians that have been deployed in factories and facilities all over the world. So um, we look at what it takes to do economic development and economic development and transition. And what I'd like to tell you is it's not as complicated in some ways as it looks, and then, but when you get down to it, it can be incredibly detailed. What we've done as a state is we've looked at uh, marketing the assets that we have, uh, looking at what we can do with those assets. I personally never went to a coal company and asked them to mine more coal. I'm confident that Keith has not been to a gas company to ask him to drop more wells. So that focus has always been there. Um, but it takes persistence. It takes persistence in marketing what we have and staying with the course. And it takes priorities. And we talked about this conference that Tech Connect put on on Wednesday in Charleston, and it was wonderful to hear Brad Smith and into it. But Jim Clifton was also there from Gallup. And if you want someone to show you a path forward and back it up with numbers, Jim Clifton is your person. And I have two takeaways from that conference that I want to share with you to get to my last point. The first one was he took on this idea of innovation economy, and he took it head on. And he said, innovation is great. But here's the numbers to where we're not getting any economic benefit from innovation in this country. He said, innovation is the cart. Small business is the horse. Your focus needs to be on barriers to entry for small business. He wasn't talking about the people that are working for themselves to survive. He's talking about small businesses as defined by 1.4 or more employees. And the other thing that he said that I thought was really interesting it was in response to a question about how do we get the capital to bring businesses here. And he said, I'm not talking about relocating wealth. I'm talking about green sprout entrepreneurship. And when I talk to a true entrepreneur, do you know what question they ask? They don't ask for money. They ask for customers. They ask for clients. So when you take someone that backs up numbers with how you get there from here, it shows us that we probably need to think our perspective. We spent all morning hearing about how there's been a decline in the traditional fuel for West Virginia's revenue, not even necessarily the economy, 
The coal decline has hit West Virginia very hard because we have a centralized tax revenue. We get severance tax from coal, we get severance tax from gas, and we redistribute that throughout the state. What we need to talk about is taking that narrative and reframing how we're talking about it, the movie in our mind. If we don't visualize a happy ending, we can't work to get there. So we have to be careful what we talk about, how we say it, and what we're talking about even amongst ourselves. We're all trying to get to the same place. We all want to be here, we all love our state, and we all see the potential. How can you not listen to these young gentlemen and think to yourself, we have a path forward? They're great. These are the guys I grew up with. They're awesome. We just need to figure out how to reframe our narrative and our perspective to find them the clients, to be able to enable small business, and then we turn them loose on the innovation. So having said where we've been, what we can do, turning it over to Keith Burdett, who may be the most qualified Secretary of Commerce the state has ever had. He's been a small businessman, he's been a legislator, and he's been an economic developer. So if you've been up to Parkersburg and you see Hino Motors, thank this man, because he was probably more responsible for that than anybody who worked on that in incredible project. So he has all the perspective. Um, he has the ability to, to have been the person signing the payroll. He has been on the legislative side, so he's seen the policy challenges and what you have to do. And now he's been the salesman for the state for five years, and he does a wonderful job. Well, let me quickly make a correction. Uh, Jay Rockefeller was very responsible for Hino Motors <laughs> and all the work he did in that. I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I need to, to reemphasize or to emphasize a couple of things that Kelly said, uh, especially when we talk about economic development in West Virginia. I didn't do it. We don't recruit extractive in industries. West Virginia Development Office, to my knowledge, has never, ever recruited an extractive industry to the state of West Virginia. So you'll excuse me when I say that in the West Virginia Development Office, everybody, when people start to say, we have to diversify our economy, the hair on the back of their heads just stands straight up. Because that's all they ever do, is work to diversify the economy of the state of West Virginia. The difference is, and why there is a change in the tenor and the discussion, is because talking about other things in West Virginia, things other than energy, is a little like uh, being uh, Martin O'Malley in a room full of Hillary Clintons. You just can't get any attention. You just can't get any attention. So when we make a big announcement, like Procter & Gamble, everybody stands up and applauds very nicely. And then they go back to their life and think, that's great. It's nice we could do that. The truth is, is they're a huge exception to the rule, but they're not necessarily, um, they are, in fact, a trend line. If you look at the trend lines in West Virginia as it relates to manufacturing, a place where we have gone from up to bottom, there's actually a trend line back up. It's slow. But it raises a lot of questions. And what is happening in southern West Virginia raises a whole lot more. Um, a magazine in the trades recently said that had Procter & Gamble announced last year the full scope of their project as it is about to be fully announced, it would have been the single largest industrial project announced in the country last year. It would employ almost 1,000 jobs, maybe, maybe more. In two days, three weeks ago, Boone County, West Virginia, lost 2,000 jobs, paying on average $80,000 apiece. Now, we live up here. You all live up here in Morgantown. Just think what the reaction in this community would have been had a couple of companies in a two-day or longer period of time announced the loss of 2,000 jobs, paying $80,000 apiece. John wasn't painting nearly as stark a picture 
as it actually is. Because as my daddy always said, the difference between a recession and a depression is a recession happens to everybody else. A depression happens to you. So as we try to change the, the narrative and change the picture, not just in southern West Virginia, but the whole state, more specifically southern West Virginia right now, it requires us to think not just what we have and the assets that we can mobilize quickly, it also requires us to think about where we want to be because that's not quick mobilization. That is not quick mobilization. There is nothing about instant gratification in this discussion, nothing. But if you're sitting in Logan County, West Virginia, this is really nice, but I need something right now. I've got a mortgage to pay. I have kids I want to send to college. And yeah, it's really nice of you to talk about me going up because there's a job in Morgan and in, in, Mon in Monongahela County or a job in Kanawha County. I can't sell my house. Everything I own is tied up in my house. So when John paints the picture of coal, there it takes on new, new and different meaning for us. So let's talk about the nows. The number one now in southern West Virginia, and quite frankly, in many, many parts of West Virginia, for a broader-based uh, industrial economy, <laughs> is site. We don't have them. And the problem is exacerbated when you go south of the Canal River. On project after project, when companies have asked about locating facilities, not even large companies, but medium, small manufacturers, from Kanawha County south, and they look for literally 50 acres. We can't find them. We've moved companies to Putnam County, West Virginia, because we couldn't find a site in Kanawha County, West Virginia. And when you go south of Kanawha, it's a non-starter. So site becomes an issue. Now, I give my boss a lot of credit. One, one of his projects right now is to take a site called Hobbit. I was asked if it had to do with Lord of the Rings when they read it on the paper because it looked like <laughs> Hobbit. But it's called Hobbit, Hobbit. It's 12,000 disturbed acres, 25 miles south of Charleston, on quarter G, a track about the size of the city of Huntington that he wants to develop into a hub structure. He wants to develop, develop that into an uh, industrial commercial hub, a place where the sites can be as small as an acre or as large as 1,000 acres. It's a possibility. It can be a reality. It takes resources and priority. We have to have infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen. I, th these are fundamental discussions. These are these are bricks and mortar discussions. In this region, believe it or not, we are working to try to solve problems in extending natural gas to plants that don't have it in a state flooded with it. But the infrastructure, in many instances, either, is either antiquated or doesn't exist. In Morgan County and Jefferson County, West Virginia, which have huge potential right now because of their proximity to the Washington, D.C. market, they are a propane-only county. And then you come to the big enchilada. There is an infrastructure piece that could level the playing field in big and small communities, and that is broadband. The problem we have is that we are running afoul of the traditional capitalist model. And that is, we're not a real good return on investment for stock holding, stockholders in those companies. We have to decide if we are going to uh, surrender to that situation or we're going to press it. And that requires resources as well. I would argue to you today 
that, and without any disrespect, any disrespect to the incumbent providers, we are not going to be their best return on investment. But we can't wait for that. We have to develop a system, and we have to do it in a fashion that can create core hubs of information at world-class speed into rural communities, which are the hardest to get service to, if we're going to provide new opportunities in regions of the state that desperately need it now. And then comes the last big piece of the puzzle. Area Development, as I may have mentioned, is a, is a publication for people who are building and designing new companies and this, that, and the other. And they do an annual survey of those items that are most important to the location of a company. This year, the number listed 27 or 28 of their top priorities. And they, they split it into two surveys. The first survey is made by those who are CEOs in companies that are actively exploring expansions or new facilities. And the second were those companies, or those site consultants who do this every day for a living for multiple companies. They surveyed them separately. There was one item that was number one on both lists at the top, as he used to say, with a bullet. In the CEOs, 94% ranked at number one. In the site consultants, 96% ranked at number one. And it was a highly skilled workforce. And ladies and gentlemen, statistically, we don't have it. We have hardworking, dedicated, uh, efficient, effective employees who I can go anywhere in the world and tout and I can give you example after example about how well they do. But when you're sitting in California trying to decide where to locate your next facility and you pull that information up on the internet, it says it has the lowest percentage of college educated workforce in the country. It has a, a, a poor showing on standardized tests. It's not doing what other states are doing in basic skills. That's what we're competing against. There is, a, there is an alarming statistic, and I tell it to you because you're here because you're motivated about this conversation. We do have good employees here. We do have hardworking employees here. I would stack those in the marketplace up against any. You're right. They are motivated. They are skilled. They have great talent. But we're talking about how others see. I'm talking about how others see us right now. And when I look at a couple of key statistics, it scares the living daylights out of me. I asked the president of a community college not all that long ago, said of the, of the B students, now that's honor roll in West Virginia, of the B students that enroll in your college, how many require remediation before they can get to a a credit gathering course. And her number was over 60%. And that's bad. What's worse is the statistic that says of those students that enter college and, re and require remediation to, to succeed, less than 20% ever get a degree. Now, there's a disconnect, ladies and gentlemen, and we better figure out how to fix it and fix it pretty quick. We are losing kids in the system. We are, we are, we are dealing with a population who culturally have been able to go underground and make $80,000 a year right out of high school. Or my parents and my, quite frankly, even my generation in which the chemical industry would take you off the street, train you the way they want. That's not how the system works anymore. And we've got to figure out how to break down those barriers so that we can get our statistics in line with the country. Because our core values, our core values are strong and attractive. We don't have, to, I, I listened to this the other day. 
uh, one of the presenters says, we don't have to change our core values, our character, to get what we want. But we've got to get those core skills in line with what we need. So I, I, uh, I, I, I sat here during the presentation by Brandon and his group and said, what, I what we really need is an, is an audience full of Brandons and Colts and Glens, uh, because they've got, they've got the right thought. We're all talking about it, and they're doing something about it right this minute. Um, and that's the position we are in. I have great confidence. I, I tell everybody every day, every day, I have had a lot of different jobs. Can't seem to keep one. <laughs> and I've never had a job I love, love, more than this one. Because every day I get to go all over the world and, and tell people why you want to be in West Virginia. And those that don't know think that's a tough job. I don't believe it to be a tough job. I, I love that job. But I'm smart enough, I think, on at least this subject, to know that in order to get where we want to be, we have to, we have to fundamentally focus on core needs. That same, st this is my biggest political comment, because it came up during the session when I met with the legislature and I told them, work, I said, workforce, workforce, workforce. That same study that ranked priorities, ranked right to work 16th and 18th. It's not about the show. It's about the substance, the substance. We have got to focus resources and attention on the substance, and we will be successful. I have every confidence in that, but it has to be about the substance. Tom? And that is a perfect segue to Tom Haywood, who, again, has divided his time between public service and private success as a, law for, as a leader of a law firm. He was chief of staff to Gaston Caperton, who led a revolution in how we view education in West Virginia, figured out a way to pay for it. Um, and Tom has since dedicated his time, uh, what little of it he has in free time, to serving on boards such as the Benedum, Imagine West Virginia, uh, Discover the Real West Virginia, to bring his expertise and his vast intelligence to improving West Virginia and adaptive change. So very pleased to have him here to follow up on what Keith says. Now that we've defined the problem, Tom's going to tell <laughs> us how we can it. solve it. Thank you. Wait a minute. Let me get my notes. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly, for that kind introduction. I'll do it all in 10 minutes, too. It's really <laughs> going to be easy here. So it's great to be here today. Uh, it's it's um, uh, exciting to think about our future. And we've heard about the challenges. We know, uh, Provost, this is a moment. This is truly a moment for our state and in our state and for so many of us. Uh, like, like I, I'm, I consider myself twice blessed because I'm a West Virginia by birth and a West Virginian by choice. Uh, and so that's a wonderful thing. And I want to, I want to, I want to talk about, I'm going to start with and end with the word perspective, okay? So, um, and I'm, Senator, I'm going to weave you into this because you helped me understand perspective. So... Where would you rather live, Outer Mongolia, 832 A.D., or West Virginia, 2016? Not even close, right? Think about this for a second. Perspective. If you lived in Outer Mongolia, 832 A.D., you were going to do what your father and your grandfather and your mother and your grandmother did, right? Today, we can create any future we want for ourselves, period, end of story. What an incredible asset and opportunity. So, just in the last two weeks, um, I do have the opportunity to participate in a lot of things, and <laughs> I attended a two-day meeting of Reconnecting McDowell, of which I'm on the board. I'm going to talk about that. I attended a meeting in Logan, West Virginia, last week revitalizing Southern West Virginia. I attended a meeting in South Charleston, West Virginia, the tech economy, Brad Smith, Jim Clifton, chairman and CEO of Gallup have the chance to be here today and just think about this. And so I, I have the great privilege of being uh, connected with a lot of organizations as we think about a small state and yet still very disparate in our efforts. So let me, in the limited time I have, 
try to connect some dots, at least as I see it, and tell you why I have never been more excited and optimistic about West Virginia's future. We've heard, we know everything we've, we've heard, right? And we know this is a moment when we are in transition. But let me just share some experiences just over this last two weeks, which might also renew and reinforce in youth some things you know, but maybe we forget. So there I was at Reconnecting McDowell. 100,000 people 30, 40 years ago, industrial giant coal mining. 100,000 people. Millionaires, men in them like day and night. Today, uh, just went under 20,000 population. 37% unemployment, rampant drug abuse, very challenging. The majority of households do not have a, an income earner in the household. A majority of students do not live with a blood relative. This is a challenge, folks. This is a challenge. And I give great credit to the AFT and Randy Weingarten and Gail Manchin, who co-chair this project. Business and labor and government leaders have come together to say, we need to improve education. And we quickly realized to improve education, you have to improve the economy, you have to improve health care, you have to improve all these things have to go around it. And is this daunting? Yes, this is daunting, OK? This defines daunting. Eighth poorest county in the nation, statistically. So what's happened in the four years we've been there with effort? We've given every, every kid from between 6th, and 7th, 7th, and 8th grade a tablet, 10 books for every student in the county. We're building a teacher's village. We've got people engaged and committed. The committees are now running themselves instead of being run. And so now the educational assessment, they've come in. Graduation rates are up dramatically. Dropout rates are down dramatically. Teen pregnancy, highest teen pregnancy rate in the nation, is down dramatically. Teachers are staying. They used to have 40% turnover in teachers. Why? There was no housing. We kept saying, what's the best thing we can do to improve education? They said, housing. I said, no, listen to the question. What's the best thing we can do to improve education? <laughs> housing. Let me understand that. We have, no, we have not built a new house in McDowell County in 30 years. There is no housing. All of our teachers commute from Raleigh or Virginia, Raleigh County or Virginia. And we lose them after a year because they can stay there and make $5,000 more. So this is daunting and challenging. But my point with this example would be the decisions we make, the actions we take, can move the needle and can move it very quickly, very quickly. Logan County last week, 200 and some people, Chief Logan State Park, talking about envisioning a new economy. And this is hard. There are seven counties in southern West Virginia that actually the economy is gone, right? Functionally, the economy that has been there forever is gone. And you walk in, and you might expect people to be crying in their beer, but people are not crying in their beer. There was more energy and enthusiasm. I heard Brandon present there. Uh, people are excited, and they're getting it. Rusty Justice, a bit source presented. We had laid-off coal miners talking about the future. We had the economic development folks. They see a future, and we, and we now know this is becoming internalized, that coal in the way it was, how it was, is not our future. We need to build on that historic asset, we need to build on that base, but that is not the future and we'll get there. And then you go to, to Wednesday in South Charleston and you have a Gallup organization, which is wonderful, go online, they've researched everything at Connect Dots, it's amazing what data analytics, and so they say, here's the message. Across the world, every study shows five out of a thousand people are entrepreneurs. It, it, is, it is a constant across race, gender, ethnicity, region, location, locale. What we've never been able to figure out is how to identify them and groom them in a farm team. And now Gallup has done that. They actually have a strength finders thing, which really is doing this. They're partnering up here with WVU and the provost and President Gee. And really, we're looking to pioneer that sort of concept. Imagine if you can make the Brad Smiths and the Ray Lanes and the John Chamberses and the Joe Maxwells and just keep minting these people, because they're coming back in a heartbeat, because they love this state. It has an attractive power, right? It has a very attractive power. They love this state, and they're coming back. Uh, so we have, you know, th this is going to happen. You're going to see some exciting announcements. I would make the case that if you take perspective, uh, Gary White said this from the panel. He was with Governor uh, Tomlin at the panel for the Ho Hobbit 21, the Hobbit, Hobbit 21. 21, and um, he made this statement. He said, I've been in the coal mining industry over 40 years. I have never been more optimistic about the future of southern West Virginia because the assets we have in place today far outstrip the assets we ever had before. We just don't have a current economy. 
So we have to understand perspective. Think of this as a transient phenomenon. Think of this as a, a, the nadir, and this is the time we build. So it's cold. I'm very excited. I, I serve as I have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the board of Southern West Virginia. You make me very proud. You're, you're going to do it. It's exciting. And you see these stories all over Southern West Virginia. And imagine the strength, imagine the sustainability, imagine the resilience of an economy built on local connection whether it's food chain being local, whether it's tourism being built locally. Imagine, imagine the strength of that building on the resilience of West Virginians and all that we have. So that's the future I see emerging very quickly. I'll just touch on a couple of the other assets. Philanthropic asset in this state is, is at a phenomenal level compared to what it ever used to be. As Kelly mentioned, I have the great privilege of serving on the board of the Benham Foundation. Forever, it was the 800-pound gorilla, but it was the only gorilla in the forest. If, you know, it was really doing it. If you look around the state today, all across the state, we have great charitable philanthropic asset. Greater Canal Valley Foundation, about $240 million. Parkersburg Area Community Foundation, $40 million. This area of the state, they combine two, about, about $20 million right now and growing. Tucker County Community Foundation, over $30 million. This didn't exist 16 years ago, right? So this is, huge. this is local resource being invested locally. So let's begin to think about these resources that we have. Research. I have the privilege of working on the board of Matrix, former Carbide Tech Center. More patents in the world came out of the tech center until very recently, until just within the last couple of years, more patents came out of that zip code than any other place in the world. Great asset, great resource. We've been at it 11 years. Our first quarter, 2016, blowout quarter. Look for the, look for the tech center. Look for that future is gonna be brighter and bigger than it ever was before as an open research park. That is happening, folks. What's going on here at WVU with research around the state, University of Charleston, Ed Welch doing a great job with innovation, reinventing education and thinking about education entrepreneurship. We have those nodes of activity and people get it that entrepreneurship is the cart pulling the horse of innovation. And it's gonna happen very quickly for us here. Um, capital formation always has been a challenge to our ability to move forward, remains a challenge. Right, we have to figure out how to actually build the build the new the, the 16 inch water line when all we can afford is an eight inch, and we get caught in this trap. Right, how do you how do you build with resource you don't have? Well, we've been creative, we've been resourceful, we figured out ways to do it. We now have some. Uh, I participated in the formation of a of an angel fund. There was a big question by the people going into it, is there enough deal flow, is there enough opportunity? And the definitive answer by the group that assembled that was yes. At this moment, Joyce, at this moment, the opportunities have never been greater. Three and a half years later, we've, we've made eight portfolio investments, fully invested, every investor delighted with where this is going, and says we've got to do a set for fund number two, and it's got to be bigger and better, and we're leading the Appalachian region, and actually this model is now being replicated across Appalachia. We can be a leader here. We've got regional initiatives, both locally and regionally across state lines, the power of 32, all these things going on with North, I mean, we're beginning to erase lines, we're beginning to connect trails, we're beginning to connect people, we have this opportunity. So I would say to you, just as we think about this, and think about the resource, uh, Robert C. Byrd Institute has a robotics program going on in McDowell County, RCBI. We've got the FBI Fingerprint Identification Center, Crown Jewel Technologies, Forensics Biometrics, Everyone in the world would give their eye, eye teeth for that asset. It's Silicon Valley, it's, it's Route 128, it's Dallas-Fort Worth of this day and era, and it is here. It is here, it is a gift, and if we don't build on that, shame on us, but we are. So if you think about all those activities, you really see you know, why I think we have uh, optimism. Manufacturing is coming back, if you actually listen, and we see this with our clients. Uh, Joe Kaiser, who's the CEO of Siemens, says the U.S. has an enduring competitive advantage in manufacturing for the next 50 years. Why? Because of cheap, available, abundant energy and all that we have in terms of rule of law, uh, you know, capital markets that work, incredible stability, and we still are the beacon for the world. So perspective. I, I would really say that as we think about these challenges, we need to celebrate success. We do need to be thoughtful about how we talk and project we need to, as leader, we, especially in these challenging times, as we know we have struggles, because the now is very hard, and the now is a depression for many. And for those in particular, we need to be real leaders. So, sorry about that. I get very excited about it. Thank you all.
We have a few minutes for a few questions, if anyone has questions for our panelists. educate them <laughs> okay they have to have the data they have to see it in paper and they have to have someone telling them the best thing to do um, because look nature abhors a vacuum without the idea put forward people are going to come up with their own ideas and I'd turn it over to the former legislator to tell you how fast ideas can take hold in the legislature and if you don't start off with a plan, you're not going to probably develop it in the middle of the session. Well, well, let's start much more elementary than that. You start asking those questions before you go vote for them. I mean, uh, to, to be blunt, I mean, it, it's very difficult, and I've been on both sides. I, you know, I was in the legislature for a while. I left because of illness. The voters were sick of me. That's the way the cycle works. <laughs> the, 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 the uh, you, you, you have to, you can't anticipate that you're going to elect one thing and hope for a different outcome. It just doesn't work. And, and I, I can tell you, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I know because we're being forced to do it and we're finding ways to make smarter, more efficient decisions. That's very reasonable to expect. But, but you can't cut 30% out of the operations of the state of West Virginia and think you're going to deal with broadband and, and infrastructure and education. It just, it just doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up. And that's what we're talking about doing. We're, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the, to the bluntness of you can't cut your way to prosperity, but I can tell you without thoughtful and strategic budgeting, you can't fix anything. And, and we're not at thoughtful and strategic budgeting right now. We, we um, um, but I, I, I go back to my original point. You have to become a more educated electorate. You, you, have to, you have to think about all these things in these seminars and then go to those candidates meeting and ask those pointed questions. And don't, we, we've subscribed in this country a little too long to what I call the bumper sticker mentality, and it's always paper thin. You know, it's, it's, you, you see those quick things, yeah, yeah, right on, right on. And they don't get to the, to the substance of it all. And, and so um, that's my two cents. Provost, I might just add to that a just a couple of I have two, th two th thoughts. One is... Um, I think it's a challenge for our nation, not just West Virginia. I, I think it's cyclical, um, I, and, and we are entering a new cycle. If you go back to 1960s with the Great Society programs, keep in mind there were, there were two underlying assumptions that, collected, that connected our collective psyche, I would argue. The first is that we, we have resource in this. We are a great nation, and we have resource. And the second is we can make a difference through programs and initiatives and policy. Mm -hmm. I would argue that today those presumptions are precisely flipped. And so we face a very significant challenge because the presumption is that we don't have resource and that government can't do anything and do anything very well or right. So that's a real, I would say that's a systemic cultural change that, that we have to gr grasp and realize uh, because the, the mantra of no new taxes read my lips has become part of the, the cultural milieu that we swim in. Now, the second point I would make, being the incurable optimist, but I think also it, it being, being accurate, is that, as has been said by many folks here, Charles Patton said it about his modeling, and we've heard it from others, this is a dynamic equation. 
things change very quickly. And so I think we have to always take care to separate the needle from the noise, be, pay attention to what's transient. But I think we do need to find successes. And, and, but I don't presume that five years from now, the public dialogue around investment is the same as it is today. Yes, delegate. So I think that the um, nurse practitioner bill is a perfect example of what West Virginia can do when we pay attention to what our problems are. To your point, that was very narrowly prescribed to get better health care to our rural regions where people have to travel a long distance to get quality health care, or maybe you've had a decline in the provider population. So that, to the optimistic vibe that we're all here to talk about because we love our state is a perfect example when West Virginia defines the problem we are a small enough state that we can come up with a solution and very frequently they're innovative solutions so I think that's a, a perfect way to have the right idea to be able to execute on it and then educate to Keith's point the electorate on why that's the right thing to do why that's a good idea because at the end of the day Everyone wants to have their own situation improved. It's why some of these bumper sticker slogans have appeal, because it brings down to what you're looking at right now in your life that you feel is deficient. This changes the conversation. This is how we can fix the problem of getting affordable health care to our rural counties. It's exactly what, how this is supposed to work. And it begins to change the narrative and the perspective, to Tom's point, that affordable health care is not a bad thing. Affordable health care keeps your grandmother and your papa and your aunt and everybody healthy where they want to live right now. I look forward to the Senator's comments this afternoon at lunch, and I know we're getting into his time uh, because he is, without question, uh, the foremost expert that I know on this subject. But from a development perspective, I will tell you this cuts two different ways. From a job creation, from a job creation opportunity, uh, it is a growth field. There's no question, and, and uh, there are, are huge opportunities for those that will get into the field, and clearly it is a training path that we are, we are uh, advocating in many regions of the state. But from the development end, there's a different factor. People are paying more and more and more attention to the cost of all this services, and it is, you know, you can purchase, if you are not on uh, a plan, I have a son, who has uh, two small children, married, two small children. Uh, he uh, makes a little more than, than average, quite frankly. Um, his monthly insurance rate with a $5,000 deductible is over $1,000. Um, I sat with a, an exec that I'm trying desperately to drag into the state of West Virginia and he spent an enormous amount of money talking about our unhealthy lifestyles, an enormous amount of time talking about our unhealthy lifestyles, the propensity for obesity in the state, the fact that it will drive up his costs. And surprising to me, he then pulls out a whole list of documents comparing specific procedures being done in a hospital here versus a hospital somewhere else. And the range was on the same procedure was between $3,000 and $14,000. Um, it, it isn't just one issue. It, there, there are multiple components to the discussion about health care in West Virginia. And some of them cut very strongly for us, 
some of them cut very strongly against us. We, we need to get a little more balance in that equation. But we've made enormous progress. There's no question about it as a country. We are putting money. A, a lot of charity care has been wiped out because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this state has benefited tremendously in many, many respects from it. Uh, but, but it is a big, big topic in general as it relates to the future of the state. If I might just uh, add a couple thoughts, Delegate. Um, so I'm going to go back to Southern now because we do. We spend a lot of time training, retraining a lot of adult learners, a lot of adult students, including returning veterans. We've had some very great success. Se Secretary Karen Bowling, we're here, DHHR Secretary, she would tell you uh, we've, we've pioneered a program at Southern where we're taking TANF recipients and actually training them. The good news is their, their, their grades, their passage rates, are far higher than the student body on average. You've got a committed, dedicated uh, group of folks, returning veterans the same way, finding them jobs, farm to table. Uh, you know, General Hoyer has some neat activities going on there. Uh, the, I think the broader issue is thinking about retooling and retraining. Uh, we have two great examples. You know, we have, we, we've heard from a couple young men here who've talked about going a different direction than their parents and grandparents, right? I think it's all very hard. That's a whole other discussion about strategies for this when you're talking about how do you sell someone who's had an $80,000 a year job for a $35,000 a year job doing something else. There's a lot of issues there, and we have to have persistence about it. And, and again, I'll, I'll stop there. But I think there's a lot of good things going Going on locally on the ground around the state in that arena that you talk about. Uh, I don't want to go too far into overtime. I think I think we're going. I think I'm going to make the uh, executive decision and call it so that we don't <laughs> cut into the lunchtime. Um, but I think we're all available for any conversation after that. So now we're going to break for lunch. You'll go out, back out this hallway out to the main law school lobby, take a right, and then the very next right will be in the event space. So we'll have lunch, and then the, 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 we'll hear from Senator Rockefeller. Thank you. Very good. You, 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 you. Oh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Jamie Tom Hayward, very nice. Very nice to I always get to do all the fun stuff. And you, <laughs> what, what, a, what a pair you two were. <laughs> I, we're 